Hey everybody, as you're coming in, um, we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes here for more people to filter in. So yep. um, before we start, but thank you so much for joining. You're from Houston, sweet. That's awesome. Hey, Joseph. So for people that are joining in right now, we'll be using the chat um, as we go to collect questions. Um, so please feel free to use that and I will be responding to you. Look at that, Houston and Oxford. Already a great sampling of the world. Fantastic. Mexico. I did have a question from a couple of my roasting friends who are wondering if this is going to be recorded and then available later for people who are not yeah. able to attend. Yep. That's a great question. Yes, definitely it will be. Yep. Yep. So we will record this whole thing and then we'll be posting it um, after the meeting is over. And um, we have our awesome marketing team that will be helping with that. Perfect. Look at this, Mexico, Brazil, Ohio, Dubai, Argentina, Saudi Arabia. Wow, fantastic. Love to hear it, Poland. This is very cool. Really cool. Sacramento, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, hey, I know you're not. I, I, know that, I know he's not in Sacramento, but I appreciate this shout <laughs> I love it. Visalia, hey, we got more California, okay. Brazil, Brazil, Greece, ooh. Hey, we can tell people where we're coming. I'm coming from hey, Sacramento, Paul. California right now. Eric, where are you coming from? I'm going from Charleston, South Carolina. <laughs> Shelby, where are you at? I'm in Denver, Colorado. Okay, Anne, yours is the most exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Which, by the way, it's 2 a.m. there, so thank you so much. It's very for early. Speed. <laughs> very early. All right, so many people joining in. We'll get started here in just a second. China, Colombia, Indonesia, so exciting. Love to hear it. All right, cool. So we'll get started. So there's more people joining in. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, so welcome to the first round of Roast IDs webinar series. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, we're so glad to see the positive responses that came from the competition. We have so many of you that participated yesterday very very thankful mm -hmm. for that happy to see that you all enjoyed it if you didn't participate in the competition that's totally fine we're so glad that you're here too and uh, this webinar series is also for you so we're going to be going through the competition round each of the rose curves that were involved with uh, the competition but the idea is that we will be discussing the rose theory behind all those rose curves and hopefully that will be a benefit to everybody um, and that's not something I'm worried about because we have such awesome guests with us, with us, Anne and Shelby. Um, I'll start with Anne. Hello, Anne. Anne, it is 2 a.m. where Anne is at right now, so we're so thankful to have her here right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pleasure so to be pleasure. here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure the wonders of coffee are working well in your system right now, so we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Anne has, <laughs> Anne um, appropriately calls herself Master Roastress. I love that title, found it on her Instagram. I'm gonna use it all the time. Um, she's been in the industry for over 20 years now. She has seemingly done it all in her time, but she now comes to us as a uh, roast consultant um, as her own business called Equilibrium Master Roasters. So please feel free to check out her Instagram page and hit her up. Um, and she's also one of our Cropster ambassadors. So we're th very thankful to have her aboard and we also thanks have, for having me yes yes thank you ann cooper and also shelby williamson who is our reigning united states roast champion Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> very <laughs> awesome and she is the roaster at huckleberry roasters so thank you so much for you being here the reason that they're here is because eric and i when we were thinking about this competition we figured that we would need some great people to help us out because we don't know it all by any stretch of the imagination and nope. <laughs> um, we put together a list of people that i like to call maybe the avengers of coffee roasting and shelby and Ooh, Anne were, nice. <laughs> <laughs> shelby and Anne were a part of those people and luckily they said yes to helping us out and that was so nice of them and they helped us develop some of the uh the the competition and are also going to help us talk about it so um yeah, with that, I will. Oh, also one more thing to, to mention, um, please feel free to uh, send messages in the chat. As we go through each one of the rose curves, I will take um, the questions from you guys and then I can give them to Eric and Shelby and Anne 
um, after we go through each rose curve and then we'll also just get cool questions for the end as well and I will feed them to our awesome panelists here. So with that, <laughs> I will pass it on over to Eric. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, Taylor. Um, and once again, thank you to everybody who is joining us from all over the world. Um, super, super cool to see everyone here. Um, and yeah, we'll just we'll just jump right into it. And so, um, so um, what we're going to do um, in this in this webinar is we're going to kind of work through each uh, individual curve and kind of highlight um, what is occurring in the curve and how do those. Uh, changes in the curve actually influence cup quality um, or the changes that you're seeing on the cupping form um, that, we, that we used here. Um, a little bit of background on the cupping form that we, we used. Um, we didn't use the SCA uh, or Q grading form um, or maybe some of the other forms that a lot of you all use across the world um, because what we really wanted to do is focus in here on the changes of a coffee versus a baseline. So a roast that, um, you would call as, as being good, so it's clean, it's sweet, it's nice. And then what happens when you make changes to a roast profile and then that curve changes and then eventually you see a difference in the cup quality. And so that's kind of how this cupping form was designed and, and why we are using it. Um, so as we work through it, just kind of think about it that way that these are all changes that are occurring um, in, these, in these coffees versus this baseline coffee. Um, and in this um, first round, the baseline coffee we were using is just a, um, a Guatemala Antigua, so a run-of-the-mill, very, very nice uh, Guatemalan coffee, um, and which is one of the coffees we have at Basilic Bros here, and so those are kind of where those flavor notes come from. Um, so we'll first dive in, a little drum roll to find out what the first curve was. Um, so the first curve, um, um, what we're going to do first is kind of talk about what was the, what was actually going on with the coffee. Um, and so in this first curve, the idea that we wanted to kind of focus on or pinpoint on was this, um, the idea of underdevelopment or underdeveloped coffee. Um, and so to talk about this, um, I want to let Anne kind of take over. And also this curve does relate to coffee E. Um, and you can see that on the top, um, but yeah, I'm gonna let, let Anne kind of talk about this curve and, and why this coffee will be described as underdeveloped. Cool, um, well, I guess, I, I, as you pointed out, it's really important to make sure we, we're remembering that it's in relation to the control that's in the background. Correct. Yeah, so just reminding everybody, you know, we're not yep. sort of saying, this curve yeah. Back here. Yeah, so, but yeah, so in relation to the control in the background, we can see, that it's starting at a, well, I just had my finger pointing at it, I forgot about this. So it's starting at a, <laughs> at a <laughs> you can all see my finger. Um, so starting at a lower temperature in relation to, you know, the, the control curve. Um, and then of course, in terms of, you know, you, can, you start to see um, because of that lower start, it's then starting to, you know, turn a lot lower. Um, and I guess if you don't recognize things like that in enough time, and if you don't have what I like to call like momentum checks and stuff like that in place, um, where you can recognize, oh crap, this is going to go, you know, a little bit, you know, um, kind of slower than what I want it to do. And you don't get your gas, you know, sort of, um, in sort of adjusted in time. And then, yep. then it starts going, you know, slower than you need it to go. And then all of a sudden you're going, oh, I need to get to this end temperature, the same as the, you know, control. Um, so then you really start panicking and either start pushing in the heat um, and everything just starts kind of like, you know, getting out of control. Hence the look of this really straight, like that really straight line here to me, that, that lack of belly you could so you could say in the curve um, is a sign that you're having to push, you're, you're having to chase, um, and you know to get to where you need to be. Um, yep. And then, then of course, by the time you mark your crack, and then you've just got this really short amount of time here between crack and to get to that the same end temperature as the control, it's just this blast of you know heat and, heat and everything's just going so fast and hot. And that's also then, you know, confirmed by your rise rate being so much higher. Um, there's yep. no ability to, to cruise out <laughs> like the control. Like everything's just, you know, really, really hot and out of control. And I would almost potentially um, maybe think because you're going so hot and fast on the end there, along with being underdeveloped, you might get a little bit of tipping. Um, because of the excessive amount of energy, depending on, you know, if it was a Brazil, um, like a softer bean, you might get some tipping, but you know, if it's a, you know, the Guatemala that you had, 
it's you know a harder bean and, and it's a bit hardier so yeah. potentially you could you know get something like that in the cup um yeah. shelby what do you think <laughs> Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of uh, what you're saying. I think that sometimes when our roasts are a lot colder to start, we do panic and we put that extra gas in there. Uh, yep. And the, the thing to remember is if you're at a higher gas later on, like Anne was saying, your bean is more delicate as you roast it. And so having that higher temperature at its more delicate stages is going to give you a risk of roast defect. Uh, yeah. of having that that tipping and facing on that bean from too high of application too late in the roast. Um, and then also just that short development that's on this coffee compared to baseline. Um, I can't quite see how long that is, but it's like, it looks like about a minute, minute development versus like that minute and a half, minute 45 of the baseline uh, is gonna cause the interior of that bean not to be fully developed, even if the exterior of that bean uh, reads the same as baseline. Uh, because mm -hmm. the beginning of this curve, this whole front part of uh, the roast is a lot colder, meaning not enough heat is being applied uh, mm -hmm. inside of, into the interior of the bean at the beginning of the roast. Um, and that's where you're going to get those hay-like flavors. Uh, so yep. it can also have ashy flavors from that later tipping point. Obviously, this particular roast curve did not have it in the flavor profile mm -hmm. but you can be underdeveloped and also have roasty flavors if you have hay like flavors that that's yep. a really good indicator that i love that yep. that bean did not receive the heat that it was supposed to receive at the front of that roast um yeah so i think that's a big thing and anytime i see like an ending of a curve like especially the rate of rise uh, let's see if I can get my pen to actually work. That rate of rise where it's just a straight line to the finish and then it was dropped because clearly the end temperature got so hot that the yep. roaster would have gotten nervous that they pull it early. Um, that tells me that there was just so much heat being applied during first crack. You're above seven rate of rise all the way to the finish pretty consistently. Uh, and you're gonna you're you're going into that way too quickly. Yep. And I think that that's really not a replicable curve as well. Uh, yep. Just because there is so much uncontrollable momentum. It's just panic, the of that panic yeah. mode. <laughs> I've, I've seen that curve before. <laughs> it's like, shit. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Open the door. <laughs> <laughs> my my yeah. new pro policy on that one is that's that's we're just going to let that go and that's going into cold brew. Instead of panicking. <laughs> panicking or, or, or flavor. <laughs> That's right. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, and so, in addition uh, to this curve, a great, uh, a great image that we have, um, we pulled from baristahustle.com, and you, and you talked about this, and um, is just the the differences in the color of the outside of the inside of the bean, and it's something I, I really want folks to to highlight. Um, and underdeveloped, we're not necessarily talking about light roasted coffee. Um, that, that's not necessarily the case. So the idea here is that it's going to look the same as this baseline coffee, um, or at least very similar in terms of the external color of that bean. Um, but a big difference is going to be what it looks like on the inside um, and how, how roasted or how developed that part is. And that's where you're going to really um, get a lot of those, those hay-like, those vegetative, and those, like, those off uh, flavors, um, as you and Shelby and Anne were talking about. And I think just on that point as well, with if people are doing um, their colour measurements, um, their delta spread between the whole bean and the ground will be, you know, mm -hmm. incredibly a lot light, you know, a lot wider yeah. than um, than what you would normally have. Um, so that's why it's really good if you do have a set base point for your delta spreads with your your bean measurements, then you'll know that's a great way to also confirm um, if you do your colour measurements straight after roasting before you head into cupping, you can head into that cupping session knowing already, of course, you've seen the look of the curve, <laughs> but you can also help somebody learning um, by doing a colour measurement and go, okay, my delta spread is way too wide. That's also going to confirm what we're going to taste as well. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I think it's always good to remember, like, I, I love being able to take color measurements, not necessarily as like, oh, my delta is, you know, over 30. Clearly, that means that this is going to be underdeveloped. And like, um, I, I log all of my stuff in CropStore, and then I kind of just forget about its existence so that I don't think about that data <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm cupping. Um, yeah. But I mean, I've had coffees that have a huge point spread difference, and it tastes better than anything that I get within what mm. I would consider like my window of acceptability of like when I'm thinking about what a perfect roast is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and at the end of the day, I think 
even if the if, even if you look at this chart and you say okay technically this coffee is uh, medium light underdeveloped uh, it's actually tasting better than anything else that I've roasted so that's what the profile is going to be and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's underdeveloped uh, if it's not exhibiting those flavors yeah yeah no those are those are wonderful points and I that's a great point you made there Shelby about um, not not religiously following those 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 delta spreads, um, like tasting your coffee. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the most important thing. It's the most important thing, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Always Have taste, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is which is another reason why we kind of use the the form that we use here is it's all in comparison to what coffee tastes good and what coffee um, yeah. yeah what coffee tastes good. Um, so wonderful. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna jump into the the next curve. Um, so once again, curve one. Um, so that before, before we do. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. yeah. So let's. We have um, so one of the questions was what machine was it roasted on in batch size compared to the control curve? Eric, do you want to chat about that real quick? Yes. So um, in this instance, you can find all of those kind of environment, those assumptions that we have in regards to the batch size and the roast uh, roasting machine on the web page, um, where you all click the link. If you scroll the way down, it's at the bottom. Um, and this machine was a, a Probitone 12 kilo. Um, and uh, the I have to check the the batch size that we had wrote on there. Um, but the batch size does not change um, between any of these roasts. We're not we're not switching it up. They are all um, the same. So the idea is that the only differences that are occurring are things that you're actually controlling on the machine, um, mostly with with uh, gas application. Um, so, yeah. And then the other question was, um, how is the acidity the same as the baseline with less than half of the development time? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so with this one, uh, if once again, if you if you go to our cupping form uh, description on that web page, what we're talking about with the city here isn't quality. Um, we're not we're not um, highlighting the quality of the acidity or the quality of the body or the quality of the sweetness. These are intensity changes. Um, so the idea here is though the quality um, of that acidity in the underdeveloped coffee might be um, lower, um, it might be a lot harsher, it might be a lot more of a like, chlorogenic acids, kind of that sharp acidity, um, it's still there, there's still acidity. It's just not necessarily good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely with acidity, it's one of, it's like the first uh, component of coffee to develop and also the first coffee component to degrade while uh, going higher and longer in a roast. So I think that totally makes sense. Like uh, perhaps some underdeveloped roasts don't have acidity because that acidity hasn't really developed and you're left with just that chance. hay flavor. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah, but sometimes an underdeveloped coffee can still have that hay-like flavor and then also have the peak of its acidity totally developed. It's just not very friendly because it's so sharp and it's so yeah. sour. Yeah. yeah, cool. Any any more, Taylor? I think we're, yeah, we're good to move on there. Cool, cool. So yeah, once again, uh, Rose Curve 1 matches with uh, Coffee E. Um, and so jumping into Rose Curve 2. Uh, Rose Curve 2, um, the idea behind this curve is we wanted to highlight uh, overdevelopment or overdeveloped. And we caution, uh, we caution here by saying overdeveloped. Um, what we're trying to say is in comparison to the baseline, this coffee has more development. It is overdeveloped in comparison to the baseline that you see in the background here. Um, and so I don't know if uh, either Anne or Shelby, when do you want to kind of jump on and chat about this one really quickly? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, even just glancing at the curve, it's pretty clear that this is a much more developed roast, both in time and in temperature. So you can already mm -hmm. assume that what's being developed in this coffee is going to be more in that chocolate, cacao, roasty uh, flavors, because chocolate is kind of that last thing that's developed with coffee. Yep. Um, so, I mean, just just looking at how much energy it has at the very end as well. Like the rate yeah. of rise really doesn't let up to the very finish. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the last curve, that when you have so much energy being applied on a bean that's constantly losing its uh, uh, structural integrity, I guess you'd say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna start developing those roasty, roasty flavors. And uh, looking at the flavor notes, it's pretty clear that um, you've got cacao, roast, spicy, bitter, uh, caramelized. Yeah. Uh, and then the acidity is in the negative category because you have already gone past roasting and developing that acidity and now you're starting to develop chocolate rather than uh, those fruit and acidic notes. Um, and then the other thing to look at as well is um, 
the charge temperature. I think that's just a good way to look at like, how did we get here versus mm -hmm. um, necessarily charging your coffee that high. Although I think, what is it? It's like 400 and... Oh, I, in this instance, it's right around 400. 400, okay. So this one's actually not that much higher, um, I don't think. But um, yes. yeah, sorry, that was my bad. I was looking at the It's okay. One. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 um, no, I mean, like, it's, it's following the curve for the most part through the entire curve. So it kind of yeah. looks like the, the very last change that was made at the, was that first crack. You're applying a lot of heat, trying to take that longer. Um, and, and again, using that overdevelopment moniker is not necessarily, um, it's not that it's wrong. Like, we use it in-house all the time because we are talking about overdevelopment compared to what we are trying to achieve with that coffee. So, like, oh, this is our Colombian uh, Gesha and it has roast on it. Like, that's overdeveloped. Um, it doesn't mean that it's the wrong way to uh, roast that coffee. It just means for our purposes that it's, it's overdeveloped. And it's the same thing with this one. The baseline is what you're going for. And then if this has roasty cacao and that's not what you're looking for, you're not doing a darker roast, it's overdeveloped. Mm -hmm. No, that's spot on. Yep. <laughs> Pretty okay. much. Cool. cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. And then one thing, one thing to note on here that I want to draw attention to is the, the body is one. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an increase in body here. Um, and I know some people, um, my, our body, as you continue to roast coffees darker and darker and darker, will actually begin to decrease and get quite thin. Um, but there's a point in which that body is increasing and then it begins to taper off. And so this one was a little tricky. Um, when we were creating it, we weren't necessarily sure where to put that body, um, because it can increase a little bit more if you're roasting lighter and then it will begin to drop off later on. Um, and so if anybody noticed that, like, Hey, why is, why is the body higher? Um, that's, that's why. Yep. Cool. And then um, just uh, once again, touching upon these ideas of these roast colors, um, this one is going to be falling in that, that medium to darker category here, um, but still developed throughout the bean um, pretty well. Um, there's not any noticeable differences from the outside to the inside. And so once again, uh, roast curve two is uh, coffee A. Um, and then roast curve three, we will dive into. And this idea behind this one um, was baked or stalled. Um, and there's some interesting things that are happening um, with this rate of rise curve at the end. Um, so if uh, either of you would want to chat about this, and this coffee is coffee D for all those who are hearing me sound and tracking. Well, I would just, I'll just say this like more than anything, like, yeah, like it's just following the, um, the control to a point, but for mm -hmm. whatever reason at the end of the roast, there was a, you know, a bit of lack of control in the, in the gas adjustment. Um, yep. You know, you, we lost the, the heat and there's, there's like a bit of a whoopsie panic moment and then the heat goes yep. back up <laughs> and then it's like trying to get it back on track again. And then, and whether it's like, because there is a point here where we actually reach um, you know, we match the, the end temperature for the control. Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, because of what was going on with the gas adjustments, then there was just that, you know, that thought process to just hold it in, whether it was to meet the time um, of the, the intended roast time. Um, and, you know, trying to meet that, that whole um, uh, premise for the, for, the, for the profile. So, yeah, again, like a little bit of panicking, getting back on track and then meeting end temperatures. And, um, and then, of course, then there's, there's the effect on the, the overall, everything's getting flat, you know, in terms of the acidity, the sweetness. Um, yeah, and explaining why things are muted um, because there's just no opportunity for any continued, um, you know, development after, after that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think the end of that roast is definitely the key to when we're talking about baked flavors. I mean, I know a lot of yeah. people have opinions yep. on what that actually means. <laughs> yeah. um, because it, it is kind of a, and not arbitrary necessarily. I mean, obviously the, the general cup flavors are going to be muted, lack of acidity, but um, by having the coffee stall out, like you're at rate of rise zero for an extended period of time, especially, you're yeah. starting to oh, allow yeah. the interior of that bean to catch up to the exterior development yeah. of that coffee. And then everything kind of just lacks complexity. You've already gone past the point of developing your acidity, but you're not really developing any fruit and you're really just mm -hmm. turning it into a single flavor, very muted coffee. Um, I find that for me, like this curve is, uh, is definitely a great representation of like losing your power. I know some people who actually <laughs> roast like that on purpose. 
Uh -huh. um, which is pretty, pretty weird. They call like it resting at first crack where they cut the gas and then they like throw gas okay. on it again. I don't, yeah, I, I don't roast like that. You will. But, Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. But I do know people who do, um, but okay. they do, they do end up having like more of that like graham like coffee yeah. flavor. Um, yeah. For me, baking usually occurs uh, when you have cut gas too early at the yeah. end of a roast and you're not going to be able to achieve your end temperature that you were hoping and you're just and kind then, of holding on to that hope that it might just just get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you're just coasting that end temperature yeah. for far too long and then you just start to have a very single uh, flavored, flat, uh, bready coffee. I think it tastes like graham crackers personally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Hey guys, just a quick note here. Um, a comment that was mentioned is that uh, imperial measurements are so confusing, and us Americans are very sorry about that. Um, <laughs> oh, we're very, very sorry. Sorry. <laughs> if, sorry. If we look, if we look, if we look, look on the y-axis, you do see some uh, Celsius numbers over there. Celsius, but just, just yeah. so everybody knows, um, for for almost all of these, we have first uh, first crack happening at about yeah. one. For, for example, on this curve, it's one ninety six um, Celsius, and then in co for color change, we have our first color change note, we have 157. For each of these yeah. curves, that's going to be um, nearly the same. I think it, it, it varies by one degree um, mm -hmm. for, for all of the curves. So we can, um, so you can know for each of these, it's going to be 157 for color change and, and about 196 for first crack. We'll go through yeah. them though as, as we go into, yeah. into each curve. And, so I'll, I'll mention and Eric, this was a, a three millimeter J type curve or a uh, J type probe, sorry. Uh, Taylor, I think that was yes. one yes. that you had selected. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. Cool. Got it. Um, perfect. Um, so let me uh, really quickly. So once again, uh, that curve three uh, matches with coffee D. Um, and just kind of highlighting those, those flat citrus like, um, very like, not uh, developed uh, or not clear uh, acidity notes. It's muted, kind of bready, graham crackery. Um, huge drop in sweetness um, is, is what happened there. Um, so now moving on to curve four. Um, curve four, the idea behind this curve was scorching. Uh, so we wanted to highlight a coffee that has a very extremely high um, start temperature in comparison to what you typically would use typically is used for a baseline coffee. And now this start temperature is going to vary depending on your machine, batch size, um, just like what you're going for. Um, but in this instance, we wanted that difference to be um, pretty extreme um, versus the baseline. Ooh. And then kind of seeing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then just kind of seeing um, how that influences the curve and then how that influences the actual um, flavor of that coffee. Um, so yeah, either of you want to chat about this one. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, well, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is the curve I had pulled yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. Uh, yeah, so uh, clearly this one is quite a bit higher than all of the other ones. Um, yeah. We're starting at like 500 degrees. Uh, yeah. And again, like I know that the numbers are confusing, but ultimately uh, when we're just comparing them to baseline, I think that's kind of an important thing to keep in because even Fahrenheit, yeah. we can vary 40 degrees machine to machine, probe to probe. So um, I know we're all used to our numbers and have like our normalcies that we use, but um, ultimately just looking at baseline to what's actually going on is um, pretty important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so and just, what just jumping in really quickly, Shelby, uh, once again, on the left is Celsius. So it might be 500 uh, Fahrenheit for folks, um, but this is 260, sorry, 500 Fahrenheit and then 260 Celsius um, for Oh. Which is hot. <laughs> That's hot. Yeah. That's hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this coffee has started super, super hot um, and has a high turning point. Like you, those are all just indicators that your uh, starting temperature is much too hot for that particular coffee. Uh, and the main issue that you're going to have with this, because you can see that the rest of the curve kind of matches up. It's like, okay, I caught the mm -hmm. curve and then I kept it online for the rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, your main issue is going to actually come from the moment that those beans touch that drum um, and that's where you're gonna start getting scorching defects and it's gonna basically look like you threw green coffee into the drum and if you were to release it right then there should be little black marks on the mm. coffee itself from the face of the bean touching or any part of the bean touching that drum that is yeah. heated way too hot 
uh, for the structural integrity of that bean. Uh, yeah. Obviously, all coffees kind of have a different threshold for what is too hot and what is, you know, too cold based on their density. And um, but pretty much any any bean that you throw in at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, I think, is probably going to exhibit some of those roasty notes. Um, but because you were able to save that curve and bring it back onto baseline, you're still going to be developing a lot of that uh, citrus and apple uh, and a lot of those really nice acidic and fruity flavors. But unfortunately, on top of that, you're also going to have something that's probably going to be more like spicy, uh, mm -hmm. potentially roast. This one, I think, is pepper. Um, yep. And that uh, those are going to be kind of indicators that it's like, okay, well, I'm developing the fruit and the complexity of this coffee, but I also added uh, some in, uh, incorrect heat application at the beginning of this roast. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, looking at the high turning point and, and uh, the high charge temperature, it's pretty clear that you'll have some scorching. And the yep. nice thing with scorching is you can usually look at your beans and it will tell you, uh, <laughs> hey, I was this good, is yeah, what's going I was on. Perfect. Yeah, because I was going to jump in and say everything you said, definitely by the time your beans start changing colour, you'll start to see the little black dots um, showing themselves. Um, and you'll know, you'll just go, ah, oh, damn, um, if it's not evident straight away. And then another really good visual is if you do drop in too hot, if the edges, in when, when the beans are still green, if the edges of the bean um, go pale or kind of white, that's mm. also like an indication that you've got stress, um, you know, on your bean as well. Um, and then sort of like with the, the flavor note of dry, to me generally, dry, I associate dry with going too hot and too fast at the beginning of a roast. That, that can be, it's not always, you know, airflow changes and stuff like that. Um, I do it, yeah, going way too hot and fast. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, and that I love that um, you know that spicy. There's you, you'll never forget tasting um, a scorched coffee because <laughs> it's like this little pr this prickly sensation on your tongue, and you're going, "Wow, that's really fascinating. What, where is that coming from?" And it's that that's that peppery, spicy tickle on your yeah. tongue. Yeah. Yeah, and just for like ah, like in the roastery uses for trying to check about scorching, I always like with new coffees, I'll be pulling my trier, you know, from the beginning till about yellowing every like minute or so. And it kind of lets me know like, where is my heat application too aggressive? Um, and then that kind of gives you an idea of how to back off heat or back off your batch size so that you're able to not put those defects on that coffee by putting so much heat so early on on the coffee. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And Anne, one of the conversations we were having previously, and this applies to you as well, Shelby, was differences between scorching and tipping. Um, mm -hmm. um, can you chat quickly just about tipping? Um, because I know that's something that some folks might might get confused um, in this instance. Well, I'll just say, like, for me, I generally attribute uh, tipping towards the end of the roast. Mm -hmm. And it's generally a symptom of using, um, you know, excessive heat, you know, your, your lack of control, um, because the beans are so sensitive, you know, kind of like crack onwards towards the end of the roast. And instead of the, the energy coming from the centre of the bean, the energy has then got nowhere else to go, but it starts to exit the end um, of the bean. Yep. And, and then you start to see like excessive crack points. Um, and then like, sort of like black marks also on the on the end of the bean and and unfortunately that is you know something that can happen more so with softer beans like lower density beans okay. if you do lose control um maybe even naturals as well um but for me it's yeah more of the the end of the roast um yeah it'd be great to, yeah shelby what what do you think in terms of tipping yeah, and, and scorching I I definitely agree with that. I mean, we uh, have a machine right now that is just one of those machines that's really uh, prone to uh, roast defect like that, especially tipping later in the roast. And so we had yep. to do a lot of work thinking about, okay, well, where is this occurring? Is it occurring at yellowing? Is it occurring at first crack? Like, where is the heat application too aggressive? Uh, mm -hmm. Anytime you yeah. have marks like that, the heat application somewhere in your roast is too aggressive. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we ended up having to do is we had to lower our batch size so that the heat, that the total heat that we were applying to the drum was lowered so that the steel of the drum didn't get so hot that it was burning the beans. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I would say that tipping is definitely from your, either from your first gas application, if it's occurring around yellowing, that you're okay. too hot, or you're keeping the heat too hot during yellowing. Uh, and you're getting that tipping around like the browning first crack area. So I think your trier, I know like a lot of people are kind of turning against the trier. 
uh, about pulling it and everything, but I think it's actually pretty important, especially when you're developing new roasts or trying to troubleshoot what's happening in the drum uh, for okay. those visual roast defects. Yeah, and then and then yeah, cool. flavor. Go ahead, and I would say flavor differences between tipping and scorching. Are there any unique <laughs> fla flavors that either of you find um, with tipping, or is it more so just this um, identifying it on the bean? Um. I would say like scorching a lot of the time can still have quite a few of those like fruity flavors, but yeah. I, I think that tipping tastes more like roast to me, like roastiness. Yep. And then yep. maybe the scorching can taste more like that. Yeah. That like spicy. Spicy. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's super interesting. It's just, it's really, it's really nice to hear that, that difference is explained um, just to have that common vocabulary and we're chatting about these types of things. Mm -hmm. So yeah so then moving forward um so once again roast curve four matches with coffee c um and then the final coffee um which there's only uh sorry the final curve only one coffee left would match with coffee b roast curve five matches with coffee b and the idea that we wanted to showcase here um is under roasted or light roasted coffee and once again, this idea of under roasted is in comparison to the baseline coffee. So this under roasted coffee in this instance might be nicer in your opinion. It might be a better quality, but this is under roasted in comparison to the baseline. Um, and so we'll kind of dive into that and also the flavor notes that um, come from that. And, um, and this is one that I know you had, had talked about and one that um, you have a lot of ideas on. So I would love to hear your opinions on it. Um, well, I think, I mean, from the flavor notes, the, 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 the first take is, you know, the, the quick finish, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's very, very similar. This is a really interesting curve because it, it's got the potential. Um, it could fall into baked territory because it is starting to get really yep. quite low and flat um, towards the end. Um, but if that temperature is still gently increasing and not, you know, stalling, um, there is still a little element, you know, of finishing, you know, flavor and, and development. But I think, the thing that, that, that can happen with this kind of curve as well is if a roaster is um, just trying to match the time, if they're just so focused on, I need this roast to go for the same time as the control and kind of forgetting about the importance of also matching the end temperature. So yeah. they, they might be focusing on something like only the development ratio percentage and mm -hmm. they've forgotten then about um, the time and the end temperature. Um, Pulling that up here as well so you can see um yeah so then they end up with like a lower temperature and then it ends up tasting like lighter than intended um and so yeah and also like you know with whatever was going on with the the gas adjustments towards the end um you know would sort of slowing down and um but i think just like a lack of like noticing and and um understanding in terms of the importance of matching the end temperature and the time um, and not just focusing on one one thing like you know just getting to the just getting to the same time yeah yeah and then shelby yeah i mean and pretty on it i think uh again when this is all in relation to baseline and then we're also talking about what our actual cupping notes were uh, mm. i know that like when i took my cue you know, the underdeveloped coffee was the one that I preferred because I like light coffee. Um, <laughs> but, but it was, it was underdeveloped. Damn, bro, stop. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's, so it's all in relation to uh, baseline. But once you start having like bread flavors, I think that's like my number one indicator. And depending on uh, origin as well, because you can also yep. have vegetal flavors in, uh, I find that like Latin American coffees often have vegetal flavors when they're underdeveloped. Sure. Uh, and then like more of like my African coffees a lot of the time have more of that, like they taste like uh, raw cookie dough kind of flavors yeah. um, and just not fully developing. Um, but in this particular one, I mean, you're going same time. Most of mm -hmm. the roast is exactly the same. It starts same. to be a little bit at yellowing. Uh, and then we end at a much lower temperature. So just logically, you're going to see that you have less heat applied in that coffee. It's going to be less developed. Your color readings are going to be lighter. Um, and it's going to exhibit uh, less developed flavors, whether those exhibit in higher acidity because you haven't uh, roasted that out yet, or vegetal or bread-like flavors because you haven't really developed your sugars yet. Um, mm -hmm that's kind of where you're going to get those. But um, 
I always find that like roast uh, analytics are best left for after cupping because then we can kind of start drawing some uh, ideas about what that coffee tastes like and why versus like, oh, this, this roast is doing this, therefore it must taste like this. And then, <laughs> yeah. you cup and then your brain tells you like, yes, that does taste like that. Cause that's what the theory <laughs> um, Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, looking at the flavor notes, then looking at the curve, you can say, okay, yes, this is underdeveloped yep. from, from the baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. And then, yeah. And then once again, just kind of bring this back to the idea of those, those colors and those photos. Um, this one is going to be that, that light coffee. So there weren't necessarily issues that were occurring um, at the beginning that might attribute to like a darker outside versus the inside of the bean. Um, it's really just a, um, a roast that was just let off and heat application was let off a little bit too much at the end and just really did not finish that development or at least push it to what the baseline was. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, and then just kind of reiterating what uh, Anne and Shelby were saying is um, the difference between uh, this one, uh, this uh, curve uh, here versus the quote unquote underdeveloped uh, curve was that this one is the same end time, but a lower temperature, whereas the underdeveloped was a shorter time, um, but same, same end temperature. temperature. Yeah. yeah. So so this one is, sorry, if I said that wrong, sorry, uh, the same no, it's good. Yep. end time, but... Uh, yeah, and yeah. so just kind of thinking about those two, um, those differences that, that might come about. Um, sure. But a lot of those flavor notes that you're gonna get out of an underdeveloped or a light roast might be similar, so it can sometimes be confusing. Um, yeah, on a color reading note, if you go back to, yeah, there we go. Uh, if you go back to that color reading, yeah, the beans. Uh, yeah. The underdeveloped, like the one that goes too quick, too fast, is often gonna have that, like we were talking that uh, top bean, that's gonna have that more, um, mm -hmm more uh, developed outside just because yeah. the bean on the outside receives so much heat that didn't heat. quite penetrate to the interior. Yep. And then the one that doesn't quite uh, hit the mark at the end is going to have something that's a little more uh, similar while from the outside to the inside because you didn't have that yep. quick aggressive heat application at the end to really uh, to Finish seal the outside of that bean. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, and so I think, again, this will be another one that you have kind of some single um, dimensional flavors yeah that's spot on um boom. and then yeah just going over all the curves again um for folks who who want to write those down here's a just quick slide just kind of showing the curves and then the all the copies that actually um match up with them um and another another thing that we we provided on the the quiz um was this data table um at the at the very bottom um and uh, one thing that we we found unique, just going at, at the just going over this table at the end, um, was this final um, index here, uh, this roast area index. Um, and the idea behind that is that is the um, essentially the area underneath the curve summed up, um, and it actually matches up very very well <laughs> with what was going on in all of these coffees or all of these curves, um, because if you look the coffee that was most developed or had the most heat application um, has the highest roast area index versus the coffee that was underdeveloped or the one that was shortest um, didn't have as much heat application that has the lowest roast area index. And then the other three um, match up pretty well um, with light falling a little less than the baseline. Um, and then the scorched coffee getting a little more um, because of that higher start temperature. Um, and that baked installed also getting a little bit more because it runs with that heat at the end. Um, so um, yeah, this roast area index or this idea behind roast area index, just we found to be really, really actually useful in this instance to be able to kind of match up the different curves based on what you were looking at. Um, I don't know if Shelby or Anne, you have any uh, takes on that? Um, it's personally not something that I use a lot. So it's actually, um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Michelle, I'm the same is that, yeah it's not something that i've really referred to i know it's always yeah. been there um yeah it's a it's seeing it this way is actually really cool um yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 i mean i think it's just it's another uh way of just looking at that rate of rise and kind of yeah. seeing the total energy applied to a coffee yeah. um i think it's it's just like any other piece of data that it can't really be the end all be all of like oh no. well, this <laughs> not 211 so therefore it's whatever but i think it's a good way to even use as maybe like a final point especially with teaching to be like oh yeah look your roast area index was actually six points below what target is so that's why you're getting those underdeveloped flavors and then yeah. you can kind of use it that way but um yeah i haven't really used it 
um, that much as far as uh, incorporating it into my roast style as much as probably yeah. I could. But it's kind of it's kind of interesting just a different way to look at the data. Yeah, and I, I haven't either. Absolutely. When roasting previously but this is just something that I found to be really interesting when kind of looking mm -hmm. through the notes at the end um, so um, we can kind of sit back on this screen and the, the next part that we what we want to do is kind of just open it up to a little bit more questions and answers um, so Taylor I don't know if we have any, any questions that you maybe have lined up for Shelby or Anne yeah so most of the questions that were asked in the chat um, were just some logistical ones and some data points about the the curves which I which I had added in um, <laughs> One that just came in, color change equals yellow, yellowing the caramel, right? Yeah, I, th I think the idea behind our color change notes is just what we determined that first yellow to be. Is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Eric, your mic's coming in real hot sometimes. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is this? It's, it's I know, there's you. like a... I thought it was yeah. a base or something. <laughs> it's not. It's not you. It's just, it's the. Something, something I can switch else. over to new headphones. <laughs> oh, it. Maybe it's the headphones. Um, is it possible to get a copy of these slides after this? Um, yeah, I think Eric. I think. Yeah, I mean, I. I yeah, yeah. I don't we can post it. Sharing this. Yeah, I think we'll be able to post it. Um. um um, uh, let's see more cotton, more roast area index, interesting data point to consider. Thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, as far as the, how the roast area occur, it's, it's just taking the area, um, underneath the curve, just going temperature by time. Yeah. Yep. Um, how do you see the airflow impacting the roast? Do you change it depending on the origin? That's a wonderful question. Uh, is that like a general question or, or <laughs> that's, that's like a, that's a, so I was like, that's a whole. <laughs> I was going to, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I personally, I have two different roasters. One of them is constant airflow and one of them is uh, where we can change the airflow in it. Uh, we find that uh, I change the airflow based on a couple of different factors. My first factor is density and moisture. Uh, just kind of if I have a higher density bean, I'm going to have a lower airflow typically to make sure that I'm not pulling too much heat out of the drum while I'm trying to apply heat. Um, but I can also, I can also change that idea based on, you know, is the moisture higher? Do I need to have a higher airflow to accommodate for the higher moisture content of the bean? And also, is that coffee a natural or a honey process that I'm trying to protect some of the sugars that are on that coffee? And so I would increase the airflow to theoretically increase the space between uh, the beans and the drum, as well as increase the space from bean to bean so that you're not burning off all of those sugars. Uh, it's kind of my personal approach to airflow, but I know everybody else is, every, everybody has their own opinion on that, so. Yeah, I, was, I mean, yeah, I was just gonna say very much system dependent, so I think that's a, yeah. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with roasting with constant airflow, it just, it's just changes no. how you apply heat, you know? Exactly. Yep, yep. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are we basing the green temp, uh, green coffee's moisture content and green storage temp? Um, I think, I guess it was assumed that this is just I under ideal conditions, Eric. Yeah. So those, the, the environmental temp, um, is listed in the, the assumptions page once again. Oh, okay. The start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I think, uh, it was right around, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, That's right. That's right. I don't know, I don't know the translation yeah. of the Celsius off the top of my head. Um, but you yeah. can find all of those assumptions, um, on the page. Mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep um that's good yeah altitude um i don't think we, that was a, a data point that we had added in was it uh it's roasted in sacramento <laughs> okay that's right <laughs> sacramento. that's right we'll have to look that out then um let's see let's see um so can you tell us based on your finding you would make what would make the perfect yeah so i think the idea um there might have been a little bit of confusion with the baseline the idea for the baseline here was the curve that we were looking for right the the actual approach that we that we wanted with that specific copy the ideal approach right that's what yeah. we're considering baseline yeah yeah the, the baseline would be like if you're if you're in a roastery and you release the coffee um that is what you're going for each time and then maybe um you have someone else come in and start roasting who kind of changes up the profile or things happen and then there's differences that occur in the roast curves um versus what you'd ideally be um releasing as as your coffee yeah yeah i mean that's uh, the hard yeah. thing it's like we're always talking 
one coffee to one coffee. We always have to be comparing apples to apples because you really just can't take two separate coffees and apply all of that same. Like you could have the underdeveloped curve next to a baseline perfect curve of two different coffees and obviously they're two different coffees, so they're going to taste totally different. Maybe that underdeveloped <laughs> coffee tastes perfect. That's your baseline for that coffee, you know? Like yeah. uh, this, is, this is all like basic theory and then there's deviations from that based on just differentiation in coffee. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, just to note again, I, I sent a message in here about some of the other assumptions that we had. Uh, batch size, seven kilos, drum speed, 54 RPM. And then the, the drum airflow was not too much, not too little, but a small increase in airflow from the beginning of, of the roast. Um, and again, the, the coffee that was used was um, the Guatemalan region, Antigua, um, and then fully washed variety of Ravone and um, yeah, Marcel's, yeah. Yep. Um, let's see. Any other questions here? He wants to know if anyone got a hundred percent, but I uh, I looked at his results and he actually got a zero. So. Dude. Shout out. He's the Photoshop Photoshop master on Instagram. <laughs> many great many great posts that you will enjoy if you follow him on Instagram. Um, yeah. And we will find out soon um, those that answer. Um, so are you, you're posting um, the list of results or the, um, like the, 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 the leaderboard, so to speak. Yeah. So um, at, at the end of the third round, we're going to release the top 10. Leaderboard. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know what's happening there. I don't either. But. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, yeah, at the end of the third round, we'll post the top ten, and um, yes, that would be great. Awesome. Uh, yeah. If anybody has any other questions about scoring or anything like that, please feel free to just shoot me an email, Taylor at cropster dot com, uh, and I can answer any questions about scoring or anything like that. If you have a personal question, please feel free to reach out. Just T A Y L O R at cropster dot com. Yeah, and, and likewise, building off of that, if you have any questions about the curves or how they're made, you can reach out to me at eric at balzacbrothers.com. Uh, and that's E-R-I-K at balzac, B-A-L-Z-A-C, brothers.com. Yes. yes. Um, cool. Let's see. Uh, do you mark the color change only by eye or also by temp, knowing when uh, hmm. the mire chemically happens? Because I fear by yellowing, lots of us see different yellow. Yes, and this is something we talked about, too. Yep. Eric and I talked about. Um, you want to jump into that? Yeah, so in, in this case, and this is actually um, something we all talked about with, with Shelby as well, was um, when, do, when do you mark first crack or when do you mark yellow, <laughs> yellowing? Mm -hmm. um, and in this instance, if we're using the same coffee, um, same batch size, same kind of specifications behind the roast, um, you should be hitting all of those marks at the same temperature um, just because of where that bean um, is at that point in the roast and, and how it reacts. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about that shell because that was a point that you had brought up. Yeah, sure. I mean, when I'm, when I get a new coffee in, uh, I'll be marking it by eye. And then because I am the same roaster roasting that coffee, you know, like that's kind of like, okay, this is, this is what I consider yellowing. Like this is my system. So yeah. I'll mark it. And then when I'm roasting subsequent batches, uh, at that temperature, I'll pull the trier and just kind of verify, yes, that is yellowing and put it back. But I do try to mark yellowing using temperature uh, consistencies between roasts of the same coffee, just because uh, that way I'm actually able to uh, consistently measure what, how long is my Maillard phase. Uh, and then first crack, same thing. I usually do like once I hear like three very audible cracks in the drum, that'll be my first, okay, yes, this is first crack. And then uh, when I'm measuring it from that point forward, I will use both the temperature of like, okay, I'm approaching that first crack and then kind of also just, you know, use my sensory of like, yes, we are in first crack as confirmation. Uh, but I do typically just use temperature because I think it's, it's more consistent than my ears. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I wish that my ears are as good as the probes, but they're just not. <laughs> yeah, 
when I was taught, I, I was just looking at this comment uh, down below about uh, using, like, learning to mark first crack by smell. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was actually the way that I was taught, and you can totally do that. Uh, but I actually found it kind of had some uh, inconsistencies for finishing the roast the same uh, time after time. Uh, and so I just kind of started using, I use smell to kind of get an idea of, like, what does this coffee smell like during first crack? And I use uh, my, I use like being able to hear the crack and then also using that correlating temperature to mark it on my Cropster sheet. Awesome. Um, and then looks like last one there, rolling first crack or just when you hear the smell. Yeah, looks like you just brought that up. Just, cool. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, what do you normally do to keep consistency between batches? That's a good question. Ooh. Do they mean in terms of idling the machine or um, consistency in profile or? Any, yeah, any, anything that you try and keep if you're trying to reproduce well, what you had just done. I mean, if, if you've got a production day and, you know, nine times out of 10, you are doing the same product, you know, at least three, four, five times, you know, you know minimum, you've got a chance to, um, you know, do a consistent, you know, um, profile every time. But I think idling, you know, your roaster is super important, making sure that you've got the conditions um, stable um, for that for that profile so you can maintain that consistency. Um, so, yeah, I think idling protocol in particular. Yeah, I mean, between batch protocol is probably one of the most important things that you can mm. do as a roaster to keep the consistency in your machine. Uh, and I've seen it done a bunch of different ways. Us personally here, we typically will leave the drum door open until like a specific degree like that we know that the probe is reading at uh, like 200 degrees Fahrenheit, very arbitrary number, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, yeah. And then we shut the door and I let the drum rate of rise go to zero. So like you'll see that spike because you shut the door so it gets hot and then it climbs back down and then that rate of rise will hit zero. And that kind of tells me that the drum is no longer getting hotter and it's going to just start losing heat. And then at that point I will start my heating for the next batch. And I always use the same um, gas for T heating batch to batch. Uh, so like, you know, 1.5 bars of gas every single time and then I charge the same exact number of degrees above my next charge temperature uh, mm -hmm. every single time. So just, and then I also return the airflow if I'm on my uh, variable airflow speed machine, return the airflow after each batch to the same exact number. You're just trying to keep things the same time after time after time. Uh, yep. If you have a magna helix, that's really helpful as well, just mm. for being able to tell what the oh, pressure yeah. in the drum is. Uh, <laughs> I am currently not so fortunate. We're working on that I one. I know. Uh, and, uh, and then like the other thing to consider is also, is it raining outside? Is it hot? Yep. Is it, is it Humidity. a different temperature than what, yep. yeah, is it a different temperature than what your, uh, what your profile yeah. says? And the nice thing about if you have crop stir is that it tells you, hey, your ambient temperature was, 90 degrees when you roasted this coffee and now your ambient temperature is saying that it's 65 and it's like okay well that's a huge difference what am i going to do to accommodate for that yep yeah yep great point cool yeah well, it looks like um we're good there eric any other any other notes um for uh, regarding the roast curves um no not regarding the roast curves i i think we had really wonderful discussion about them so i'm super happy awesome. with where yeah with that. well well thank you so much um ann and shelby really really appreciate it um again just another announcement if you have any questions about um the uh, your scores or anything regarding scoring at all yep. please feel free to contact me taylor at cropster.com if you have any questions about the actual roast curves or anything regarding the actual coffee or any of that data please contact eric e-r-i-k yep at balzacbrothers.com. Yep. Um, let him know if you have any questions. And also, uh, <laughs> please remember to tune in next week. We have our next second round of competition on uh, the 20th. So if we're doing Pacific time here in the United States, that would be opening up again at midnight yep. um, on the 20th, which is next Wednesday. And um, then we will also have another uh, webinar just like this and Eric do you want to let them know who is going to be in that webinar yeah so next week we'll be with uh, Rob Hoos um, uh, if I'm 
And then, uh, yeah, that'll be at the same time, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific, and that'll be May 21st, the day after um, the, the competition. Um, and just a, a little bit about round two, um, the, the next round is going to be a, a new set of curves um, with um, different different things, different themes going on behind them. So definitely tune in to kind of learn some new concepts or different concepts that we talked about this week. Um, and then additionally, we just, Taylor and I and, and Shelby and, and everyone, just we wanted to thank, um, we had really wonderful turnout, hundreds of people turned out for this this first round. Um, and so please do, like we would love to see everyone uh, participate next week. Um, there's a lot you can learn by competing and then following that up with these, uh, this webinar and just kind of hearing those curves explained and how that actually influences the, the coffee quality. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And if cool. there's any questions that we missed, please feel free to also contact us and we'll do our best to, to get you some answers. Um, yeah. Whatever, whatever things you, uh, you asked. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Yeah, and we do, have, and, and sorry for all the folks who weren't able to make it in the first round um, for those first 24 hours, so, but please do, do tune in next week. So it'll be, be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well. Awesome. Thank you so much, and Shelby. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See you later, guys. Bye. See ya. Everyone have Bye. a good day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>